he uh, also at Columbia. He was teaching at a relatively large university. Um, it was the University of Tulsa. About 5,000. But also that's not so large. It's a medium-sized university, the University of Tulsa, where he won all kinds of awards. Um, and then would go on to write the book Alessandro, Victoria, and the Portrait Bust in Renaissance Venice. Right? So um, an expert on Venice, an expert on the Renaissance, an expert on um, portraiture, as it turns out, um, an expert on sculpture. He's published in several uh, very well-respected journals, including the Hôtel du Louvre and the Burlington Magazine. He has received a number of awards, including one locally from the Metropolitan Museum. And um, he studied in Florence uh, at the Harvard Center there. And I know he's given talks at Harvard very recently. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. I'm an early modernist myself, although I work on France in the 18th century. I feel a kinship to everything um, that those French folks in the 18th century learned um, from the Italians of the 15th and 16th century. So, um, once again, welcome Dr. Martin. Um, he's going to be talking about reading the Renaissance.
That's why in the early years of our old colleges like Harvard and William and Mary, you had to pass a Latin test to get in because the lectures would be in Latin. See how easy it all is now. Now the humanists constituted an educational and cultural movement and it's in their writings that we often encounter the concept of rebirth, which of course is what the word renaissance means. For them, for the humanists, the term rebirth meant primarily a rebirth of classical learning. Why did this come about? How did this new interest and rebirth in the classics consist of? Well, it's the result of several developments. As you know, after the breakdown of the Roman Empire, learning in Western Europe also suffered a breakdown. Most of the learning was concentrated in the clergy. During the Dark Ages, about 500 to 1,000, they were pretty much the only sect of society that could read. They knew Latin, but they felt the classics should be studied only as a supplement to religious training. You learned Latin so you could read the Bible and the church fathers. You read pagan authors only to learn about early Christian history, not for their own sake, not because they were great writers. And actually there's an incident with St. Jerome that relates directly to this. He had a dream once that he was brought before a judge who said to him, Non es Christianos, es Cicaronianos. You are not a follower of Jesus, you are a follower of Cicero. And he ordered him to be whipped severely. You gotta be careful what you read. Well, the situation started to change, however, between the 11th and 13th centuries. There was a growing interest in learning in Western Europe, especially in philosophy and the sciences, sparked by the Crusades and the context that the Crusades brought about between Christian Europe and Islam. Many writings of Aristotle and other Greek scientists that had been lost in the West now became available through Latin translations from Arabic and from Greek. Renaissance humanists continued the study of Latin and Greek authors carried on by medieval scholars with a fundamental twist. They pursued these studies for their own sake. They did not believe that secular learning had to be completely subordinated to religious or theological doctrine. They weren't anti-Christian. The term secular humanist is a 19th century creation. You look more nice to animals and so forth and so on. There's no such thing in the Renaissance. Uh, Renaissance humanists saw that classical literature had merit and worth on its own and felt that if you could combine the wisdom of antiquity with Christianity, you could get a kind of new culture superior to either antiquity or present Christian culture. In other words, they felt, unlike in earlier times, you could be a Christian and still read Cicero. We see this idea of combining antiquity and Christianity in the Sistine Chapel where male Hebrew prophets are presented right along ancient female pagan sinners. Both were thought uh, to uh, foretell the coming of Christ. And that's really quite unusual. Remember, this is the private church of the Pope. Remember, this is where the Pope is elected. In a few weeks, the cardinals will gather right here under Michelangelo to elect the new Pope. This is uh, quite something that uh, in the private church of the Pope, pagan figures of wisdom are given equal billing, an equal scale to figures of wisdom from the Bible. I'll just show you those two figures here. Ezekiel and the Persians. That, in the private church of the Pope, pagan figures are given equal billing to figures from the Bible is one of the many Renaissance features of the Sistine Chapel and indeed shows the triumph of humans. The humanists were very active in their pursuit of classical learning. This is one of the most famous, the Dutch humanist Erasmus, who spent a lot of time in England. He was a friend of Sir Thomas More. They discovered lost antique texts. They edited those texts according to textual criteria still in use. And they instituted a new educational program and a new kind of school based on the reading of the classical authors in the original languages. They started the schools that survived until roughly World War I, the schools known as the Lycée or the 
liceo or the gymnasium. Remember, we think of that those schools as being rather narrow because they had very little math and science. But at the time, they, it was a broadened educational program. Whereas before, one read only the Bible and writings by saints and other religious figures. Now you read, you continue to read those texts, but you also read pagan poetry, pagan history, pagan philosophy, and so on. So for the humanists, the rebirth of learning, the Renaissance, was mainly two things. You read classical texts for their own sake, and you read many more of those classical texts, and of many different kinds. And by the way, this is usually how historical change comes about. It's not that something completely new appears out of nowhere, Something that already exists gets a new emphasis, or a new interpretation, or a new orientation. People read Latin and the classical authors before the humanists came along, but they read them in a different way, and from a different standpoint. Now because people like Erasmus felt that their own age had brought about this rebirth of antiquity, the humanists themselves made a new periodization. History. Remember, I started by talking about how do you separate history into periods. The humanists themselves did this. And again, this is one of the main reasons we're justified in seeing the Renaissance as a distinct historical period. Prior to the humanists, Christian Europe had organized history in basically two ways. History is a decline from its high point. It's a Christian society. The high point is, of course, the life of Jesus Christ. Every else, everything else is downhill until the second coming. Or, more simply, just two periods, antiquity, and then the period since the fall of the Roman Empire. The humanists posited three periods. Antiquity, the period after antiquity, in the middle, right? They're the ones who started using the terms that eventually become known as the Middle Ages. And then the modern age themselves, that they usually call l'état moderne, the modern age. The important point is that they're seeing themselves as being something different from what came before. They place themselves in history differently from how their forefathers did. And the reason for this is themselves. They are new attitudes and achievements. And the humanists not only reordered history, they wrote a new kind of history, a history seen mostly in secular terms. Unlike the medieval historians who saw history mostly as the working out of divine will, the humanists saw history as a record of human activity, inspired by human motives. The model here is classical history, such as Livy or Thucydides. And I hope you're all aware that Machiavelli wrote a rather large book on Livy. In both that book and in The Prince, Machiavelli writes humanist history, a history made by human agents, not preordained by God. So we've already seen at least three new things going on in Italy during the Renaissance. The humanists had a new attitude toward the classics and the legacy of the ancient world. They instituted a new educational program and a new kind of school. They reordered history, and they wrote a new kind of history. This attitude carried over into the arts. Just as the ancient world was thought worthy to study for its own sake, so is the natural world thought worthy to be investigated for its own sake. And one gets a nice comparison between the medieval and the Renaissance view of nature here. Uh, this is a drawing by a French medieval artist named Villard. This is a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. And you probably can't see it, but the French artist is very proud of this line. He says at the top there is contrafait à la vie, made from life. He really saw this. But it has human teeth and very nice eyebrows <laughs> and a nice curve. And, uh, you know, he simply has, he's, look, he said he's seen a real lion, he's drawn it from actually in front of the lion, but he's just not looking at it in the way that Leonardo looks at that star of Bethlehem plant. 
Leonardo's looking at it in a much closer way. The French poet Paul Valéry called this Leonardo's, quote, obstinate rigor of attention. They both are looking at things right in front of them, but they're depicting it in a different way. So just as the humanists wrote that in their own time, literary learning had been reborn and taken to new heights, so did they also write that the visual arts had been reborn and taken to new heights. So a profound shift in attitude takes place during the Renaissance, which allows us to recognize it as a distinct historical and cultural period. Many other things happen during the Renaissance that differentiate it from medieval times. In terms of political organization, the main event in Europe is the beginning of the breakdown of feudalism. What turns up instead is the rise of the nation state, the form of political organization we still use today. In feudalism, many powers lay in the hands of the great lords, the barons. They had the right to make law. They had the right to impose taxes. They had the right to wage war. But beginning in the 1300s, becoming ever stronger in the 1400s and into the 1500s, we see in Western Europe, not so much in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, the rise of the sovereign state, the nation state, where power is located in a central authority, usually a king. And over time, it usually comes as the king now who has the right to make law, the right to impose taxes, the rise to uh, raise an army. And the nation state first took its shape in a recognizable way in the Renaissance. And again, it's one of its very important legacies to today. One place that we see that very much is Spain. Modern Spain started coming into shape when uh, Isabella of Castile, that's the yellow part, married Ferdinand of Aragon, these two places united, and then they teamed up to drive the Moors out of Granada. And by that time, they would have something practically identical with the modern boundaries of Spain. Some of you may know, they drove the Moors out of Granada in 1492. That great military victory freed up funds from the defense department. So they had funds to spend on sending people across the Atlantic, right? And of course, that reminds us that the Renaissance was also the great age of discovery and exploration. And here I just show you the roots of some of the early explorers. The Renaissance was a time when, for the very first time in human history, you have truly global trade and communication. Earlier times had gotten near it, but it had never been truly global until Magellan's uh, voyage around the world. With the collapse of feudalism, we also see the start of a new economic system called capitalism, where the main figure is the individual entrepreneur who goes out and tries to make a profit on his own. Now, this tendency towards individualism is something frequently remarked on in studies of the Renaissance. And in many ways, we see that also in art. And again, it's an important way of distinguishing the Renaissance from what came before it, and of distinguishing Renaissance art from medieval art. When you think of late medieval art, of Gothic art, the primary image that hopefully comes to mind is the Gothic cathedral. So just here, the cathedral at Chartres in northern France, built 1194 to 1220. It's a huge all-encompassing structure, thought to contain all human and divine knowledge. It's, as you can see, I'm looking at the cityscape, it's still the dominant structure in this town, it's the physical focus of the town, it's obviously the religious headquarters, it is often also the economic headquarters, as well as the institution of higher learning. Before the rise of the universities, the institutes of higher learning in Europe were the cathedral schools. And Chartres had one of the most famous of these cathedral schools. So it's all encompassing, like the universal medieval Catholic Church. All the individual elements of the cathedral, the stained glass, the sculpture, the architecture, is just part of a whole. And it's architecture that's the primary art form of late medieval art. But in the Renaissance, it's the individual painting and the individual statue that become the primary art force. 
The discussion of Renaissance art usually centers around style, but an equally important occurrence is that art production undergoes a fundamental shift. Uh, what I mean by individual paintings is what we now think of as paintings, the kinds of things we go to see when we go to an art museum. Like what this young lady is seeing in the very early Metropolitan Museum. Right? You see autonomous, independent images, usually with a frame around them, hanging on a wall. Most of the time they can be moved from one place to another relatively easily. These sorts of objects basically did not exist in the Middle Ages. There were some objects like them, icons, like this, which is about this big. They're relatively small. There were some images, like paintings, as we think of them today. But they're minor. They're relatively unimportant. There were pictorial arts in the Middle Ages, designs on flat, two-dimensional surfaces, but they were not what we would call paintings. And they're almost always on surfaces larger than themselves. So what would they be? Well, the primary pictorial arts during the Middle Ages were things like mosaics. Pieces of glass and tile attached, literally attached to the building, right? It's not autonomous. It's not independent. It's part of a larger structure. Another great pictorial art was enamels. Again, the image is not autonomous or independent. It's on a surface larger than itself, even if the object is not that big. It's the individual images aren't meant to be seen on their own. Or illuminated manuscripts. Again, it's part of a succession of pages, and usually on the individual page, pages. You often have separate images. It's not an independent autonomous image. Or stained glass. All these things are the much more important pictorial arts in the Middle Ages, stained glass, enamels, manuscript illumination, mosaics. The same is true of sculpture. Most medieval sculpture was meant to be physically attached to a building. This again is Shark Cathedral where you see the sculpture at the main entrance. And even on smaller objects, again, the Individual scenes aren't meant to stand on their own. On this ivory casket, for instance, that's in the Metropolitan Museum, you see a bunch of different images. Of course, reliquaries are a particularly good example of this, and of course, they often themselves look like architecture. It's in the Renaissance that we start to see individual autonomous paintings and individual sculptures that are meant to stand on their own. This is a seismic shift in art production. It's during the Renaissance that individual paintings and sculptures first become the primary art forms, the kind of objects we mostly see today when we go to museums or galleries. So here's a real differentiation in the artworks themselves, not in just what the humanists said about them. It's not just what the intellectuals are claiming. You actually can see it in the artworks themselves. So, what is Machiavelli's relation to all of this? Here are two portraits of Machiavelli. This is a portrait bust that seems to date from his own time. And this is a portrait made later in the 16th century. Because the biggest intersection between the Renaissance and Machiavelli is that he was a humanist. He is, in fact, a textbook example of a Renaissance humanist. He's someone steeped in classical culture and in classical texts. And it's real for him. The most touching example of his identity as a humanist and of his devotion to the ancient world comes in his letter from December 1530 to his friend Vittorio, which I ask for you all to have read for today and which sometimes has been described as the most famous letter, letter ever written in Italian. It came from a very hard time in his life. Remember, he joins the Florentine government in 1498, after the Medici family had been exiled from the city. Machiavelli rises to become the number two man in what we would call the State Department. He goes on all sorts of special diplomatic missions, both abroad and in Italy consorts with important figures like princes and popes. The Medici return in the fall of 1512, and he, like many of the old government, 
was fired from his job. Even worse, he then was accused of taking part in a conspiracy against the Medici in early 1513. He was arrested and put in prison in February. So by the way, so that was February 1513, exactly 500 years ago. And he was in prison for a month, for a month. He got released in March 1513, and at which time he took his family to their country farm, surely in order just to save money. There they could live off the produce of the farm itself, while probably renting out their house in town. That's why that letter to Vittori from December of 1513 is written from his farm. He lost his job, which he liked very much, found meaningful. He lost his family's main source of income. He was suspected by the government of treason. He'd been subjected to judicial torture while he'd been in prison, and perhaps come close to being executed. So, if you think about last semester, just as the Divine Comedy resulted from a deep crisis in Dante's life, so did the Prince come at a time of very deep crisis in Machiavelli's life. In the letter to Vittori, as you know, Machiavelli describes his typical day on the farm, rising early, tending to chores, overseeing work, catching birds. He discusses how on his daily rounds, quote, I have a book in my pocket, either Dante or Petrarch, or one of the lesser poets, such as Tobolus, Ovid, and the like. I read of their tender passion and their loves, remember mine, enjoy myself a while in that sort of dream. End of quote. Notice he doesn't differentiate between the modern poets, Dante and Petrarch, and the ancient ones, Tobolus and Ovid. It's all the same to him. Just as easy to read the ancient poets in Latin as it is to read the modern ones in his own language. Then he says at midday, he has the main meal of the day with his family, and in the afternoon, he hangs out in the tavern with his rustic friends and neighbors. But the climax of his day comes later, when he enters his study, takes off his work clothes, puts on special clothes, just to read the Latin authors he loves so much. And this is another, probably contemporary portrait of Machiavelli, and I bring back the St. Jerome picture you saw earlier. Obviously, it's set in a big space, but the part that Jerome is in probably resembles somewhat Machiavelli's study. They usually had built-in desks, with a, what's called a writing slope, and often built-in benches. And, so forth. and he tells us, quote, on the coming of evening, I return to my house and enter my study. And at the door, I take off the day's clothing, covered with mud and dust, and put on garments regal and courtly. And reclothed appropriately, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where, received by them with affection, I feed on that food which only is mine, which I was born for. For I am not ashamed to speak with them and to ask them the reason for their actions. And they in their kindness answer me. And for four hours of time, I do not feel bored. I forget every trouble. We had a lot of troubles then. I do not dread poverty. I am not frightened by death. Entirely I give myself over to them. Notice that he describes reading the ancient authors literally as food that nourishes him and seemingly keeps him alive. He feels personal relationships with these long dead authors. They welcome him and talk to him. As a high-ranking official in the State Department, he needed Latin as part of his job. But as the letter to Vittori proves, he also just loved Latin. He loved the ancient world, and he looked to it for guidance and wisdom. And as you all know by now from your reading in it, the prince is full of quotes from ancient authors and citations to incidents from ancient history. So he is a humanist, a committed humanist. He's part of the most important and influential intellectual movement of his time. And by the way, although the prince is written in Italian, in Dante's Tuscan dialect, uh, the chapter headings are all in Latin, something I've never seen discussed anywhere. And when in the letter to Vittori he mentions that he's just written a little book, uh, he gets the title in Latin. He says, I've written, i composed a book, De Principatibus, on principles. So again, you see how this thinking in Latin comes very naturally. But the relationship to the Renaissance goes far deeper 
than just his identity as a humanist. But the Prince is in all sorts of ways typical work of the Renaissance, and it's radical. It's modernity. It's willingness to shatter old beliefs, or at least to question them. In fact, it's absolutely typical of the Renaissance that while he worships antiquity, he's rooted in the present. He thinks for himself. He's not tied to the past. He does not think that because Aristotle thought X, then he must also think X. And of course, in this respect, uh, he shows the way to Galileo, right? You'll recall that Galileo's first great experiment was about motion and weight. Aristotle said a heavier weight will fall more quickly than a lighter weight. Galileo said, okay, let's do an experiment instead of just accepting Aristotle on authority. Goes to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, drops a 10-pound weight and a 20-pound weight, and boy, they sure seem to hit the ground at the same time. Hmm. The Renaissance humanists respected tradition but they questioned authority, which I would say is a good stance for anyone. Authority was much challenged in the Renaissance, the greatest example being, of course, the Reformation. And you know, I remind you, Machiavelli is only a little more than 10 years older than Martin Luther. And remember, the discovery of the New World also played a role in the questioning of authority during the Renaissance. Remember, I had said earlier they thought of the cathedral as the sort of depository of all human and divine knowledge. Yes, we have Aristotle, we have the Bible, we know everything. But the New World showed that was wrong. No one knew about the New World. Not Aristotle, not Moses, not Jesus. The discovery of the New World is one of the best reasons for showing that antiquity isn't enough. You need your experience as well. qualities that make Leonardo's view of nature so different from the artist of the lion also apply to Machiavelli. Whereas Monsieur Villar uh, relies on schemata and models from the past, Leonardo relies on his optical experience, on depicting what is actually in front of him. Just so Machiavelli. In the dedication of the prince, he says the best thing he has to offer is his knowledge, in particular, quote, his knowledge of the actions of great men. And how does he say he got that knowledge? Quote, through long experience of contemporary affairs and extended reading in antiquity. Experience and antiquity. Artists use these two sources as well. The great compliment for the new, more naturalistic Renaissance art was that it seemed like life itself. It was as real as life itself. And I show you here, uh, this is a Cabrera altarpiece by Piero della Francesca, maybe from around 1480 or so. There's going to be, by the way, there's a small show opening very soon about Piero della Francesca at the Frick Collection. Artists took a canon of bodily proportions from ancient sculpture to understand anatomy accurately, and then they placed those figures in ever increasingly naturalistic settings where light falls, the way it does on Earth, from a specific light source, where textures are conveyed very convincingly, where space can be accurately measured and plotted out. If you look very closely at this picture, he's telling you this is taking place in the crossing of a church, because you can just see the corner of the front of the church. And that's the apse, so they must be under the dome know exactly where they are. It seems real. Although the subject matter often refers to religious experience, the way the subject matter is depicted refers to the real world. That's the claim Machiavelli makes about his book. For all his love of antiquity, he does not hesitate to criticize it when he deems it necessary. See the beginning of chapter 15, where he makes a thinly veiled negative reference to a book you all read last semester, The Republic. Quote, since I intend to write something useful for an understanding reader, it seemed better to go after the real truth of the matter than to repeat what people have imagined. A great many men have imagined states in Princeton such as nobody ever saw or knew in the real world. And there's such a difference between the way we really live and the way we ought to live that the man who neglects the real to study the ideal 
will learn how to accomplish his ruin, not his salvation. One of the most realistic aspects of the prince is that it describes a dynamic, ever-changing world. We first meet that world in chapter 3, which opens with the sentence, it's a new state that causes problems. King Louis of France invaded Italy, conquered Milan. He lost it twice. How could he have held on to Milan? Well, he could have gone to live there. He could have set up colonies. You may recall, Machiavelli gives King Louis six different options, any of which he claims would have worked better than what Louis actually did. It's a changing world. You must have your wits about you to change with it, a subject he explores in greater detail in chapter 25. And it's right in Machiavelli's time, a little after this picture, we see that dynamic world of the Renaissance, especially in the art of Leonardo da Vinci, someone he must have known. Why must he have known Leonardo? Because in the early 1500s, Leonardo was working on a project in the building where Machiavelli worked. This is the Palazzo Vecchio, Florence, the old city hall. That's where Machiavelli had his office. In the early 1500s, Leonardo was working on a fresco in the great council hall on the main floor. He never finished it. It showed a great uh, Florentine victory in battle. Battle of Anghiari. We have this copy by Rubens of what we think was a drawing by Leonardo. It shows his favorite topic, movement. Movement and change, which is something Leonardo had been exploring since his youth. We see it in this early landscape drawing of 1471, where he tries to show, tries to give some indication of the waterfall and of the waves that the water makes when it falls down. And he uses these sort of, uh, these abstract kind of brush strokes, pen strokes rather, for the trees to try to get some indication of the wind moving in the trees. It's obviously a topic my, uh, Leonardo was exploring in this red chalk drawing of a thunderstorm in the mountains. And it's even a topic he probably was exploring in the Mona Lisa, where we see her set against that great landscape behind her, where the wind and the water have worn the rocks away into these craggy channels and peaks. Of course, the message is that, since the portraits always refer to death, right, her beauty, and though she's young, her beauty, too will eventually get worn away and change over time. Even closer in time to the prince is the Venetian painter Giorgione. Really the first uh, artist in Western art to depict purposely mysterious subject matter, where an anonymous cast of characters seems as transient as the lightning bolt flashing in the sky. That static world, that static world of the earlier Renaissance ends around the year 1500 to be replaced with a much more dynamic world. Machiavelli lived in a time when the rules had changed. When he was growing up, Italy was free of outside interference. The Italian princes fought among themselves and made decisions among themselves. Starting in the 1490s with the French invasions into Italy, that all changed just like Giorgione's lightning bolt. The prince charts that new world as the world of the Renaissance was in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I, I tried to keep my talk to about 40 minutes or so, I think I was somewhat successful. How about that? We have and about so six or seven minutes for questions. We have time for questions. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. You know, I, if, if any of you have been to uh, Leon Bostein's concerts, the classical, what, what's it called, classical? Declassified. Classics declassified. You know, he asks for questions. He says, you know, I'm, I'm also willing to answer personal questions and so forth. So. <laughs> now, what happened after 
question was? In his life? Yeah, no, in, yeah but not, not in his life, but like, he writes about, like, at the end of the prince, he writes about, like, what communication should do, what yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, everything goes exactly as he would not have wanted it to go. The, uh, Italy, except for Venice, Italy becomes basically an occupied country by these foreign powers. Uh, the French, the Spanish, later on in the 19th century, the Austrians, until the uh, Italian independence in the mid-1800s, Italy's mostly taken over by other countries. So not what he, exactly the opposite of he would have wanted. So the Medici don't respond to his call. And, and it would have been hard for them to do so. So yeah, Italian independence is lost. I think you know that's that's actually important for understanding Italian 20th century history. If you remember that from like the 1500s to the middle of the 1800s, that Italy was basically an occupied country controlled by outsiders. It does help to explain a little bit better why well, in the 1920s people would be attracted to someone like Mussolini. Still not that far in the past that. Austria, France, Spain is calling all the shots in Italy. Mussolini said we have to be our own. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wasn't the, the Prince published in popular life? Well, that, I've never seen a real good answer about that. We, I, I, we don't know. You know that, that, that essay in the back of your book, uh, there's an essay by the editor that's called The Outline of Machiavellianism. That's a very good discussion. And you know, he gives a discussion of the early history of the manuscript. And uh, we don't know. We don't know. I've never come across. Maybe you know, I'm not a Machiavelli scholar. I'm not well read in the Machiavelli literature. And maybe there are some reasons that seem to circulate very widely in manuscript. But yeah, why didn't he want to publish it? I don't know because many things he published after Machiavelli were printed, circulated in manuscript. But I, I don't know, and I'm, I'm not aware that we know. It's a good question. I would like to know. Yeah. Well, he, he uh, various things. He mostly uh, was a writer. That, that's where most of his writings come from. He loses his job. He tries to get uh, back into the government, but he's mostly unsuccessful. In the 1520s, he gets some minor jobs from the government, which were still controlled by the Medici, but were different Medici at, the, at that time. He, be, he became the official historian of Florence, and he wrote a history of Florence. He became a successful playwright. And uh, he wrote one play, The Mandrake Root, which actually has, if you study Italian literature, that's one of the plays from the 16th century. It's a comedy. It's a comedy about evil, tricky people. Deceiving them. Uh, that's considered one of the great uh, Italian plays of the 1500s. So he had to live by his wits. Yeah? What type of government? He mostly a diplomat, as I say, why he worked in what we call the State Department, negotiating treaties and negotiating with leaders and trying to get deals for, for Florence. And, uh, but yeah, basically as a diplomat, as a, as a negotiator. Yeah? What's the significance of the shift from the medieval to the modern or to the Renaissance um, of the art that is situated on something larger to art that stands alone? Well, as I said, I mean, now you get you get more individual objects, and uh, they become more individualized. So I'd say you know that's sort of a cliche, but I think it's actually true. Um, as you start seeing someone like Giorgione makes a much more personal kind of art than anybody had before him. Now, of course, by his time, Renaissance art had been going on for almost a hundred years, so he already has a lot to build on. So. But yeah, as you start making these autonomous, independent paintings, both from the artist's viewpoint and the patron's viewpoint, they could be more individualized, which I say <coughs> part of modernity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's more to it than that, but that's, yeah, yeah. Yes? Um, you said that the, uh, like the Renaissance thinkers mark their own period, sort of yes. for the modern period. Did they also say, well, now, because we, like you said, what we regard as the Renaissance and at a certain point, did they say, well, now, well, they were dead by then. So but, uh, but, but, but uh, yes, um, 
I actually not good on the historiography, question. but uh, you know the you know Voltaire made a new periodization, didn't he? Yeah, I mean I think that those those sort of seventeenth century folk who we would associate with the Baroque may not have said that we're not Renaissance men yeah. or something of that sort, or a version of that, but they would have talked about what they were doing, maybe calling themselves rational. You know, you know, most periods since the Renaissance have called themselves the modern age. Modern just meaning now. That's why it's sort of silly that we now use a historic, give that term to an actual historical age. But I think people weren't, I think people weren't all that set on trying to reperiodize things until the Industrial Revolution, which everybody saw really made a big break, big divide. Uh, so that's, that's, that's my impression. That's a good question. But I think, yeah, I think they, I think people in the 17th century pretty much, they're the descendants of the humanists. And uh, they probably would have saw, seen themselves as living in the same period, I think, until, until industrialization.